All right. Welcome back to Two Stupid Guys Trade Stocks. I'm Vinny. I'm Dylan. There was a rough market uh, this last week. We are going to look at some market analysis, maybe where this might bottom, catch a falling knife, if you will. And Vinny's going to walk us through uh, some ways of profit, which is for some reason no one's talking about. You yeah. should be real happy when we drop 10%. Exactly. Uh, so we're going to look at that stuff. Yeah. All right. If you guys enjoy this kind of stock market content with two stupid guys trading stocks, by all means, give us a like and subscribe below. We'd love to have you along on this adventure. With that, we'll get to it. <laughs> two stupid guys trading stocks. Mm. All right. Look yeah. at that little tumble there. Yeah, it's uh, kind of pretty, actually, I think. Yeah, like a little waterfall. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, this is the Q's. Uh, Vinny, we're at about, what, 14% correction from the peak to trough here? Yeah, exactly. It, correction territory is 10%. 20% to actually get like, a crash you know, at that point, basically. But uh, 10% is correction territory. So we're past that. We have a very hefty uh, support line at 350. Um, after hours, we are like literally right at it. Hmm. We are we are borderline touching it. Um, the next one wouldn't be till uh, about 342 ish. Okay. Um, Spy, a little bit different. What are we at here? So Spy is about nine percent from all time high pullback. 9%. So if you notice, both of them cross below the 200 SMA on, you know, insane volume. That's what this giant, giant bar is. Yeah. Both RSIs are like under, you know, around 25. What was, yeah, around 20. They're pretty much the same, around 25. Uh, as you can see, the Qs just tank right after passing that 200. Okay. Same yeah. type of deal. 427 is the next big support, which is another 11 points. Hmm. Oh boy. And uh, you saw that big spike in volume and partly due to it being the third Friday of the month and, uh, you know, options expiration, particularly January, right? You had a lot of leap options that would have expired yep. this month. Exactly. So that's certainly a driver of this and why it was so violent on, on Friday. Definitely possible. Uh, we may look at this a little bit later, but both of these are quite extended from their nine EMA. And even if you look back in, you know, COVID times during that crash, when it was very extended, it usually at least consolidates, might have like a minor up day um, until it at least catches up before we pick a turning point of falling further or going back up. So, yeah. yeah. Boom. Now, how do we profit from this, Vinny? Exactly. That's always the question. You know, I haven't seen any other YouTubers talking about this. Everyone's got like the red background and they're all like, oh, this is it. Like, this is the end. You know, the... There's the uh, meet Kevin with his Titanic video yesterday. You know, I mean, funny, very funny. But like, you know, I'm like, yeah, how about profit? It was funny. I don't like how he had diamond hands as the last people dying because that just that, that's just saying this is the end of the stock market. This is it. We've yeah, seen this go back to trading times. shells or something. I yeah. don't know what we're gonna do. Um, so I, I like options and I like you know spreads. Uh, it's a way to like, limit your risk uh, while being able to to kind of play a. a bias in terms of direction um, over a certain period of time. Uh, basically, it comes down to four main types of, of options, right? Uh, of option spreads, vertical spreads, I should say. So, you know, bull call, bear call, bull put, and bear put. And they all have kind of different things you can use them for. Uh, in general, bearish right now, right? The market's kind of headed towards bear territory. Um, so you want to look at the two bear options, bear call and bear put. The bear call has the added advantage of being a net seller of options, right? So when implied volatility is, is high, option prices go high. And they tend to revert towards the mean, meaning that it, a bear call spread has two things working for you in terms of the market going down, but also like your volatility will contract over time. So there's two ways to kind of profit with a bear call spread. At least right. My right. Just to clarify, being a net seller of options is usually more profitable than buying. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's some debate about how many options actually go on exercise. I think I put even a slide in here about that. You did. Um, but uh, it's overall, I'd, I personally prefer to be a net seller of options rather than a buyer. You know, buyers, Wall Street bets, 
you know, that's kind of thing. You know, buying the weekly out of the money options and hoping of, you know, taking your portfolio up into crazy stratospheric numbers in a short period of time. Right. You're hoping for a 5X trade. Yeah. I'd rather be the casino, the house, rather than the actual person gambling at the casino. Mm, that's a good yeah. analogy. Um, so put debit spread. This is one of the two options. Um, basically, you're going to buy uh, an option and then you're going to sell another put option. Kind of so you have this defined risk. Um, your your max loss in these is what you outlay because you're going to uh, outlay cash up front. Right. Now call credit spread. It's kind of the opposite. So I'm I'm selling a, a call option and then I'm buying one that's higher. So I'm going to receive cash up front. Right. Right. And as long as the stock closes beneath my short option, the one I sold, then I'm a, I would be at max profit. So. These these graphs kind of tell you that there's a defined risk. That's what the that's why they get these flat lines. There's a maximum loss and a maximum profit. Right. So this is the volatility index over the last year. Right. You notice it tends to kind of spike up and then come right back down. This is what I was talking about. Why being a net seller of options is usually a better idea because uh, you know it actually the volatility tends to revert towards the mean. We've kind of established a new higher mean since COVID. Um, you know, we've been hovering say right around this this twenty mark for for a while, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you go longer term historical, the, that volatility was actually significantly lower. This is this is when you're talking about pre COVID, more like mid teens. So we're still more volatile than we were before COVID. Right. You know, this is a huge bummer because I had a bunch of calls sitting. If it hit fifteen dollars about two months ago, yeah, and it didn't. Yeah. I don't know if we're going to be getting back there anytime soon. You know, the number of people trading options has gone a lot higher. There's a lot more demand for options. Um, you know, Robinhood makes a huge chunk of their profits basically from options trading. And right. I think you're going to see that continue to go forward. Options, I think, is going to be um, definitely an evolving market because there's a lot more people involved in it now. So, you know, this is that question about most options expiring worthless. Hard to know exactly. The CBOE, the um, Chicago Board of uh, Options Exchange, says only 10% are exercised, but more than half of them are closed early, 55 to 60%. So, right. don't Which really are all, all of my calls are closed early. For the most part, I do too. Um, so here's the, here's the two trades I put on on this past Friday. Um, AMD, you know, to me, from a valuation standpoint, this is this is rather disjointed from you know, reality when you look at a comparison to uh, Intel, which is a stock I'm long in. Except for the um, fact they make way better products. I digress. I'm sorry. My bad. For now, for now, that, that, that gap is narrowing significantly. Okay. Um, but uh, so from a technical standpoint, you know, you see it right here, break beneath the hundred day moving average. Um, they said on a kind of longer term valuation basis, I thought that needed a pullback anyways. Um, you got a nice spinning top here going on Friday. So I opened a call credit spread, the 120, 123. I did really short term, expiring the uh, one week later. Um, I, re I received $1.36 in credit. My max loss on this one is equal to the width minus my credit. So it would be $300 minus 136. What's that? 164 would be my max loss on this. Um, mm -hmm. As of close Friday, this was about uh, worth about $1.19, about 12.5% profit. Because um, you know AMD was at 118 at close on Friday. Did you buy multiple of these or just one? I just did one. This is this is this is in my old like Robinhood account. Uh, that's still where I am doing this sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah, you can. That, that's one way to do it. If you like to trade, you can you can do multiple of the same contract. I don't typically, but um, that's because that's a very small account and that's kind of my crazy wild trade account. <laughs> right. Got it. And I did another one. This one's a little safer. I gave myself a little bit more room. I actually came all the way up to the 100-day moving average. NVIDIA, another company that, you know, from a valuation basis just seems kind of expensive. You're seeing, you know, all these stocks kind of down, um, you know, re-rate, I guess you could say, based on um, expectation as far as interest rate. Um, so this one gave myself a little bit longer. I did check both the the uh, earnings dates to make sure I wasn't going to cross either one of them. That's why the AMD one was so short. Good call. Um, yeah, I didn't want to. Don't trade this into earnings. You got to pay attention to that, especially you right never, now. Never, yeah, there. never yeah. trade these in earnings. Look at Netflix. Yeah, never do any options into earnings. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, was shot right through it. So this one, I only collected forty three dollars. My max loss on this one is a little higher, like two hundred and seven, um, and like two week timeline. But this was already a thirty seven percent like profit, basically after one less than one day. So got it. Yeah. I mean, the nickel and dime stuff, but if you think about it, you know, th th this is uh, 
ability to earn $40 on 250 or $200 or whatever. That's a 25% return on that actual uh, kind of chunk of cash within a two week time period. And this is, like I said, this is a safer trade. And then I gave myself all the way up to 260 and, you know, it's all the way down here at 230. I'd have to move up significantly over the next two weeks for this to become a unprofitable trade for me. Right. And okay. I know Dylan made a couple of two. I did. Um, now, granted, I was shorting the queues for a long time. So I think I almost broke even because right. I lost so much money the first time. Um, but, you know, I didn't, I learned that you really got to buy longer time frame shorts. You need time for your play to play out. It's a lesson for me. At least I didn't lose too much. Uh, well, actually, I think I gained a little bit. But basically, um, I had a, I canceled the previous ones and I did a put at 350 strike price expiring in June. Um, I wanted it essentially, I had no uh, actual idea of going past April. Okay. Um, Cause I just wanted the first rate hike, to be honest. Yeah. I opened on 1220 for $1,900. And I added another on 1227 for 1218. You see how much that dropped? Yeah. Go to the chart real quick. I, I started it here when it hit the moving average. Mm -hmm. uh, I bought it intraday, so I didn't see the hammer. And then as it was going up, I was like, all right, my thesis is still the same as long as it doesn't go above 408. So I had a stop loss at 408. And okay. then um, it had a full bar here on really low volume. So I added again. Nice. And then it went down here. Yeah. Um, that one was nice. I, you know, it is... If only they were all that nice. <laughs> Go yeah. back to the deal. That was a that was a beautiful trade, man. Uh, that, that's awesome. Um, yeah. So I ended up selling. Uh, I, I made a fifty three percent gain. Here's the deal. I got out on Friday, um, one in the morning when the queues were at like three fifty five, and then another towards the end of the day at almost around the low. Hmm. I did this because I'm getting married next week. And, and I am going to be in Cancun. I don't know how reliable my service is going to be. So I don't want to have anything open. So yeah. I was like, if we didn't make a giant recovery and I lose everything, I'm going to be pissed. So ideally, I would have liked to have kept one, but it's not worth the stress. No. And so like... You don't you don't ever aspire to be that like that picture that you see on the internet of someone sitting in a beach chair with a laptop trading stocks. Not shorting, no. <laughs> no, that's true. I guess uh, you know over don't don't get me wrong. Over the long run, we're both like bullish, but when when you get these opportunities, yeah. you got to take advantage of. You got to have different different strategies for different market environments. I mean, I'm down sixty five percent on Fubo, and I still don't care. So yeah. it's that that's a long like five year hold. And I don't care. I don't yeah. lose. I won't lose sleep over that at all. I will lose sleep over shorting an index, though. So it, it's very time specific. No, I I completely get that and uh, and respect that for sure. It's definitely uh, like I said, you have to adapt to the market when you know when the market changes. Like there's all the opportunities. You just have to seek them out and learn how to you know, take advantage of them. Right. Um, this is Twitter. This was actually a swing trade video I put out um, that I, I really didn't like how it was looking. If you look. Um, at about 110, it had put a doji going down and then a spinning top. That's kind of where I got in. Okay. Uh, it looked like it was going to break. My thesis was I'm going to stop out if it crosses the 20 EMA. That's that pink solid line. Mm -hmm. it, it didn't. And it you know has been really respecting that 9 EMA, the dash line. Mm -hmm. um, I got out again for the same reason at 25% gain. I had two contracts. Nice. So... Yeah, you know, sometimes the way I think about like when to when to exit a trade is I, I look at the number of like days and I'll divide it out and say like um so say say this was trade was for a month. If you hit 25% gain in two days, then you just close it. Yeah. You know, because it really that that you should only have made that 25% gain in a week. You know, if you make that that you know you make that much of the profit that early, you just leave. Just I mean, I left out. a lot of money on, on the table of my Netflix, uh, like, you know, bearish trade, but mm -hmm. I mean, I, I made it very quickly. So I just got out. Yeah. But you also couldn't have seen a 20% drop falling. Yeah. Like, I, honestly, like no one would have thought 20, I would have thought like five or six. Yeah. Most. I, I would have been a max profit. I think even before uh, that, that happened. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> I mean, remember Netflix was 600 bucks a share, like not that long ago. True. Yeah. True. 
Um, yeah, so if you're, you know, stay calm. This is a buying opportunity. Could it go lower? Sure. I think it's most likely going to consolidate because we're really far from the nine EMA. So I think we may, you know, even have a bad morning and then dip back up or something. Um, you're looking for hard selling volume in the morning with a hard buyback in the late afternoon, preferably the last hour. And that's how you know if we're going to kind of stay put for a little bit. Hmm. Interesting. So, smart um, money comes in at the last hour of the market. Yeah, which is why you saw the acceleration towards the downside on uh, Friday afternoon. Yep. And that's when I got out. I was like, yep. all right. <laughs> yeah, good times. <laughs> All right, guys. So let us know. Like, uh, are you going to take advantage of any of these kind of opportunities to make money in this different market environment? Yeah, it should be pretty solid buying. Thanks, guys. See ya.